How are you doing guys? Again, uh, another episode of Yonkers Voice. Today we're here with the sculpture designer, writer, Vinny Bagwell. I met Vinny the other day at the library in one of her expos. Uh, the Ensla What's the name of the, the, the show? The Enslaved Africans Rain Garden. The Enslaved Africans Rain Garden. And she actually spoke about uh, a country where I come from. Remember, we yes, had a conversation. Yes, yes. Well, that day she invited me to come to her studio, and here I am today. I see beautiful pieces of art, and she's going to tell us a few things about, probably about each of the pieces, and also about her trajectory when she found out that she was a sculptor, a designer, a painter, to today. So, <laughs> really, tell, tell us how it happened. I think it began with, uh, in my childhood, I was one of those children that could draw very well from the beginning. And, um, you know, I grew up being called an artist. However, uh, I didn't go to school uh, to study art. I actually went for psychology and then later I went for communications. And so uh, I had been working for quite some time. And it dawned on me that I hadn't painted in seven years and I was trying to get back to painting and I decided to try sculpting to prime my well. So, but, but before we get there, mm -hmm. tell me about your support, your family. How was your parents? Did they support you 100% on these? How did it come around? My dad is my biggest fan. Uh, and it's interesting, you don't realize that your parents are artists because you grow up thinking that everybody's like this. So for instance, my mother is a painter, my father can paint and draw, uh, and so I'm just thinking anybody can do this. And so, uh, you know, I was told uh, early on that it wasn't something that I could do for a living, uh, so I had to try and, you know, study something else in college. So that's the reason why I didn't start off going to art school, uh, but clearly I had some kind of gift. And so uh, I ended up marrying art uh, and psychology together to do publications design. And I had mentors. Uh, eighth grade, I had a, a mentor. Uh, uh, Tony Abramson was my uh, department chair English in, in high school. Uh, college, my department chair, uh, Dr. Uh, George Carter was my mentor. And then when I got out of college, I had another mentor, Harold e. Sanderson, who was a graphic designer. So. I'm just busy working and not really thinking so much about making art and then I realized I haven't been making art and I wanted to do it so I decided to try sculpting. No, were they wrong? Can you make a living? It's hard. It's hard. It's hard. You have to, first of all, you have to really, really hustle and you have to want to work. And working for yourself, you're willing to work harder for yourself than for somebody else. But, you know, the art arena is extremely competitive and, um, and it requires quite a bit of skill. You have to be able to write, you have to be able to articulate your thoughts, uh, you have to have good ideas. Uh, and then there's something called talent, you know, because there are a lot of talented people in the world. Now, now uh, do you still remember your very first piece of art? This is my first. Uh, this one here? This one, yes. This is the very first sculpture that you did? Yes. Uh, Tell us about it. Who is she? I, I, this is Beloved. Her name is Beloved One. And um, a friend of mine's husband, uh, Carlos, came over and showed me how, like, you know, sculpting tools. This tool does this, this tool does that. And so he left me, you know, we were together for like two hours and he left me with a block of clay. And four days later, I had this sculpture. And, uh, you know, I wanted to save it. I created it originally in plastilina. And ultimately, uh, he told me he could mold it, and it got caught in the mold uh, for three days, and ultimately, we got it out, but she got quite mutilated in the process. And so, uh, only uh, last year did I finally have her molded properly uh, to be cast in bronze. So this is the original original. There, there will be a, a bronze of this too, uh, as soon as I can afford it. But at any rate, uh, the point of it is, is that this is how I knew I could sculpt. And then that first winter, this is the winter of 93, 94, we had 17 snowstorms. And so I just am making artwork. At the end of the winter, I had five sculptures. I don't know what I'm doing. We don't have Google. We don't have the internet. I'm just doing what I'm doing. 
And the question is, what do I do with them now? And I'm working in clay, not plastilina, which is oil-based clay. The water evaporates and turns into dust. So for instance, I lost Malcolm X twice. Point of it is, is that uh, I discovered that there was money in public art. And so uh, at the time I was writing for Gannett Suburban Newspapers uh, about Yonkers. And uh, you know, folks knew me here. And so I wrote a proposal to do Ella Fitzgerald. And so that became my first public art project. But that's a little different because that's where you actually create your own public art project. Normally, you have to compete. So um, I've been competing now for 20 years. Now, mm -hmm. you've been working now in the city. And mm -hmm. I saw you have some artwork you know, outside the city, I think mm -hmm. something is going to go to the broad, uh, broad walk. The Enslaved Africans Rain Garden is an urban heritage sculpture garden uh, that's going to be installed in 2019. Right now I have the funding for four out of five life-size sculptures. And how did uh, this involvement, I know that Yonkers, the city, Mayor Spano, has been involved with the, with the arts, is helping, uh, you know, a lot of people in a art field. Mm -hmm. How is your uh, Well, this actually began with the administration before his. Right. Um, at this point, New York State Council for the Arts uh, funded the first enlargement, Isati, the woman with the basket on her head. Yes. And the city of Yonkers matched that. Um, and then the National Endowment for the Arts is funding the enlargement for the children. I'll show them to you in a minute. And, um, and the city will match that. And so we're looking for funding for the last sculpture. It is to honor the first enslaved Africans to be manumitted, freed by law, which was 64 years before the Emancipation Proclamation. It's not in the curriculum. And uh, art is a wonderful way to preserve history and to map the assets of a community. Yonkers is in the process of revitalization. And so at this point, we want to make sure that the history is well documented because it could be lost if it were. So each statue has a story? Yes. Uh, all of my work is kind of like that. You know, there's always a story. I am a storyteller. And so, I uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so, um, you know, each sculptor uh, tells some facet of the story for enslaved Africans. So, for instance, um, and you might want to pan to them later. Um, sure. So, for instance, uh, Isati is uh, a woman carrying fish because this is a waterfront town. And on her back, there is the story of uh, the Middle Passage. So you have the slave ship on her back. You've got uh, there's a man drowning in the hem of her skirt. Uh, the boatman, again, most people don't think about the fact that this is early, like the, the, the late 1600s. The Europeans aren't here yet. So for every five people, four of them are black. And so you have the boatman you know, who helps to drive the boat from New York to South Africa to Madagascar and back safely. And he too has a story. And so each of them tells you a story. Most people don't know that most enslaved African were youth. And so I have two children, there's a boy and a girl. And again, uh, you look at it from the standpoint of these are people, individuals with families and memories and dreams and things like that. And all of that was um, stolen from them. And so uh, the idea is to humanize them. So I named them, uh, and again, trying to make people remember that these were people, not just some other. And so, uh, you know, I've been working with Ty Grayell, who uh, is a spoken word artist, and Ty has given them a voice. So now you have faces. I, I have the pleasure voices. to hear him. Oh, he's fabulous. He's fabulous. And so um, it, it helps people to, to, to believe that these were people that they know so that you can feel a connection with them and have compassion for their story. Good. Now I see here in your studio small statues, big statues. Mm -hmm. What is it? Do you make actually two of them? Usually... What you do is you make a maquette, which is a, for me, I use third scale. So the smallest that I want to work is 24 inches. So a life-size person, six feet, so you pick a third scale. Um, it helps you to, first of all, 
figure out what you're doing, how you want to do what you want to do, and, and then ultimately uh, an enlarger who's an engineer uh, enlarges, scales them up to whatever size. So for instance, I have a life-size sculpture, I have a seven-foot sculpture. And so I call it a body snatcher. When he brings it here, it's not finished. It's just a body that looks kind of like what I made, but not finished. And it's my job to refine it and make it look like it's ultimately going to look. All right. So before we go to the tour, mm -hmm. let me ask you this, Vinny. Do you give any kind of workshops? Let, let, let's say if there is people in Yonko that are interested, but they don't know the techniques. They, you know, they would like to know a little bit more about what's involved. Do you have any kind of a workshop? Um, generally, I don't teach. I do do workshops. Uh, usually, for instance, with the Rain Garden Project, I've had open houses. Uh, I have the students from uh, the Yonkers Public Schools and Sarah Lawrence College come in. Um, I've had Sister to Sister bring their summer program uh, youth in. And again, it's just to expose them to the environment. This is, this is where I work. This is where I live and work in the same place. Your studio. Uh, so I'm a, a self-employed artist. Uh, and so it gives people an opportunity to come into uh, a space and see what it's like. Uh, in other words, I get up in the morning, I come downstairs, I go right to work, I'm here. And so, uh, you know, it gives an opportunity to learn how public art is made. Uh, and also, too, there are stories between each piece. There's a story, you know, how it came to be, so to speak. So it kind of gives people um, a bit more understanding about sculpture as a medium but also about uh, uh, public art as a career. I guess coming to visit you is like a, a travel, into, travel into the past when the artist worked at their own Yes, studio, at their own yes, yes, yes. I'm, I'm, this I'm, is I'm, it. Yes, I I'm like, here, I work here. Yeah, like Rodin and Picasso and all of them. Uh, yes, which I, I think is, there are days when even I am fascinated by myself that, you know, I so you amaze yourself. Life. I do, you know, because um, like this is better. not what I thought. It's, it's better. It's better than what Good. I thought. So let's go around now and uh, show me about, you know, which sculpture you're going to pick on whatever one you want. Okay. You can show me, tell me about it, and tell me a little story about it. Okay. Okay. So yes. let's do it. Yes. Mm -hmm. So the Department of General Services put out a call for a public artwork to celebrate the life of Marvin Gaye because Marvin Gaye is from Washington DC and this is the maquette that I created for the competition. I won. So this is third scale. I gave this to my enlarger and he in turn makes an enlargement. When the enlargement arrives it's it's rough, it's not this refined. So it's my job to refine it and make it look like Marvin Gaye. So this is uh, taken from the What's Going On album. Uh, the irony is that, you know, in those days, we didn't have the same kind of digital photography and whatnot, but if you put the What's Going On uh, album cover on your screen, you will find that Marvin Gaye is wearing a alligator uh, embossed vinyl trench coat. So I like to use uh, relief sculpture as a way of telling the story. So this is Marvin Gaye's story. So there he is with his children. Uh, oh, that's his son. Uh, his uh, duet partners, for instance, that's Timmy Terrell. Uh, he was a Grammy Award winning artist. And again, you know, he had quite a bit of a transformation uh, with the What's Going On album uh, because prior to that, he was just a sex symbol. You know, during this time, uh, we had uh, the Vietnam War, we had uh, police brutality, uh, craziness happening at Kent State, and he felt compelled to write an anthem about it. And so the What's Going On album, of course, has become one of the greatest albums of all time and it has made him be an immortal. So again, this is all the narrative uh, from his story. And again, if you know anything about Marvin Gaye at that time, you know, again, the Vietnam War, uh, the assassination of Martin Luther King, Malcolm X. And so this is Marvin Gaye, what's going on? I'm almost complete. I'll be working on it for another week or so, and then it will go for casting, mold making, 
and uh, it'll be uh, unveiled on the 1st of April in Washington, D.C. This, behind Marvin, uh, is the piano. Uh, in 2012, uh, Ruben Santiago Hudson came to me and asked me uh, to create a piano for a play that he was directing uh, uh, that was originally written by August Wilson. And so, uh, again, it's an opportunity to do narrative bar relief which tells a story, and in this instance, the story is about uh, a, a woman uh, and her child who were sold off into slavery so that the slave master could buy a piano uh, for his wife for her birthday. And of course, uh, later on in the play, uh, the son talks all about, you know, what this narrative is uh, explaining or telling. All right. So this is. Walter Doc Hurley. Uh, it's being commissioned by the state of Connecticut for the city of Hartford. Walter uh, Doc Hurley, they call him Doc Hurley affectionately, uh, was an educator and a philanthropist. He was responsible for raising hundreds of thousands of dollars uh, for Hartford youth to go to college. More than 200 kids were able to go to college because of his efforts. So he's a local hero there. And so this uh, will become the first public artwork of a contemporary African-American man for the state of Connecticut. And then back here, uh, I am also creating a, uh, a relief sculpture uh, called The Immortals. It will be 12 feet wide. This is the first two of three panels. And uh, basically, it is a sculpture of the top singers, musicians, bands, rappers of all time. Uh, the um, Music Hall of Fame has a hundred of them and so this is going for the Ron Brown Prep School and it's being commissioned by the, uh, the Department of General Services for the DC government. So this is Liberty. Uh, the Alabama State Historical Society and the Alabama Arts Council uh, asked me to create an artwork for the inaugural exhibition at the new uh, Freedom Rides Museum in 2011 for the 50th anniversary of the Freedom Riders. And so on her back is the narrative of the story. So you've got, this is the map of the routes that they took and then down here, you've got uh, folks like Stokey Carmichael and others who were uh, arrested in mugshots. You've got Rosa Parks on the bus, uh, the names of the organizations uh, you know, that uh, helped in this effort to create equality uh, for public places. And so it's, it's quite the honor to be uh, part of that. Um, because I realize that these are the people who make my daily life possible, that, that I don't have to be concerned about whether or not um, I have the liberty of drinking out of a regular water fountain versus a for colored only water fountain. So I felt very, very responsible for making this piece and it was a wonderful opportunity to be able, again, to represent uh, people of color you know, in a public place. Okay, so here on the back wall, you have my, I call them my Bible people. You've got the woman at the well, Jacob, uh, this is Moses throwing the Ten Commandments, called Exodus 32, 19. And these are the maquettes for the rain garden. Uh, this is sunlight in my father's eyes. Um, I use it oftentimes on my Facebook page uh, to say Merry Christmas because uh, the baby Jesus and all of that. Uh, but let me show you something really important that you guys might be interested in knowing about. So this is Shola and Olumide. Um, they are the children for the enslaved Africans rain garden and I'll be enlarging them next. So I hope you guys will follow me on Facebook and Twitter, social media, and hope to see you again soon when they're big. Thank you so much for coming.